Today, I want to talk to you about one of the most underrated programs in all of computing. It's a program right in front of us every time we turn on our computer, yet we often don't even notice it. And without it, our distro simply wouldn't boot up. Still, we give it almost zero importance, almost as if it's invisible. Yes, I already made a video on the history of Grub, which was honestly mediocre, but since I'm the kind of person who's always channel surfing in my mind, I started asking myself, but how does Grub actually work? Ladies and gentlemen, forgive my ignorance. I thought it was something much simpler, almost trivial, but instead, it's a fascinating and complicated universe, and learning how it works genuinely surprised me. I had no idea that every day when I turn on my computer, such a complex process was starting up, one I was completely unaware of. Yes, ignorance can play some nasty tricks. Grub is like the Big Bang. It's the very beginning of everything. The most fascinating thing is that Grub isn't an operating system. It can't rely on an already running OS, but must invent all the tools it needs to communicate with the hardware and with the BIOS or UEFI, the layer that runs before the actual operating system loads. The OS only comes afterwards. Without this little solitary and unarmed hero, Linux would never boot. But in the end, how does Grub actually pull this off? Let's try to understand it together. Before Grub, there's the firmware. And the firmware does a whole series of things as soon as we hit the power button. The firmware accesses the hardware, checks it, and brings it to life, in very simple terms. But then how does Linux boot? How does Linux access these resources? Well, it would never manage it without Grub. It's a tiny program. Think about it. The Grub core only weighs about 150-200k bytes in a minimal version, while the full package with all modules can reach a few megabytes. The project consists of about 180,000 plus total lines of code, including about 70,000 plus lines of pure C code. The mechanism works differently for UEFI systems and those with traditional BIOS MBR. Let's look at both cases. Everything starts with the computer's firmware. It might be an old BIOS or the more modern UEFI. After post, power on self-test, the initial hardware check, the firmware looks for a bootloader, the program responsible for starting the operating system. On old PCs with BIOS, the firmware looks in the master boot record, MBR, the first 512 bytes of the disk. There's only room for a few instructions, far too little to do anything fancy. In those 512 bytes, there's barely enough space for code that just says, load the next piece of the program. On UEFI systems, the firmware looks for an executable file, usually called grubx64.efi, inside the EFI partition, a special FAT32 partition created specifically for booting. Here, there's much more space and flexibility. In the BIOS world, the MBR code does only one thing. It loads a second little piece of code. This can be stage 1.5, or if files are strategically placed in contiguous sectors, it might load Grub's core directly, formerly known as stage 2. In the UFI world, things are much simpler and more modern. The firmware loads the Grub EFI file directly, which can be much larger and more complex than the old MBR. No tricks are needed to work around space limits. Stage 1.5 is a small program hidden in a special area of the disk, usually in the sectors right after the MBR and before the first real partition. This area is called the MBR gap and is usually about 31 kilobytes. Its main function is to recognize the file system type that hosts Grub and load the minimum drivers needed to read files. This is the first sign of Grub's power. While old bootloaders like Lilo could only handle very simple static scenarios, Grub can already interpret and read modern file systems like XT4, BTRFS, XFS, even if the disk is set up in complex ways. At this point, the real heart of Grub comes into play, its core. Here, Grub starts acting a bit like a tiny operating system. In BIOS mode, it uses BIOS interrupts and low-level functions to read from the disk, print characters on the screen, and get input from the keyboard. In UEFI mode, it uses advanced APIs provided by the firmware in a much richer environment similar to that of a modern OS. Parsing the file system. One of Grub's strengths is that it can directly read an impressive range of file systems. X2, XT3, XT4, BTRFS, XFS, ReiserFS, FAT, NTFS, ZFS, and many more. This is possible thanks to minimal implementations of file system drivers inside Grub, written in C, which allow it to navigate directories and find the files needed for boot.
It's important to note these are not full implementations like those in the Linux kernel, but simplified, read-only versions optimized just for accessing boot files. The first file it looks for is the main config file. Once it finds grub.cfg, grub loads and parses it. Inside are all the instructions needed to display the boot menu, define the available options, specify kernel parameters, list any other operating systems, indicate extra modules to load. Typical directives you'll see. These lines tell grub where to find the kernel, where to find the initerd, the temporary boot RAM disk, and which parameters to pass to the kernel itself. At this point, Grub is ready to display the famous boot menu. Here, the user can choose which operating system to start, which kernel to use if multiple are installed, whether to boot into recovery mode, whether to launch Windows or another distro in dual boot. Everything is shown using graphical and text routines coded directly into Grub, designed to work on almost any hardware, from the latest and greatest to the oldest legacy machines. One of the less visible but most powerful aspects of Grub is its modularity. Grub loads only the modules needed at that moment. Modules for special file systems, BTRFS, ZFS, NTFS, software RAID support, LVM, logical volume manager support, encryption, LUX support, advanced graphical functions, network boot, PXE, and many more. This modularity makes Grub an incredibly flexible tool, adaptable to almost any scenario, from enterprise servers to your home laptop. Example menu entry. Once the user makes a selection from the menu, Grub springs into action. 1. Reads the kernel. From the partition, Grub loads the Linux kernel file, usually called VM Linux, which is compressed. 2. Reads the inner D. It also loads the initrd or initrfs, the initial RAM disk that the kernel mounts before accessing the real root file system. 3. Prepares memory. It loads these files precisely into the memory locations where the kernel expects to find them. This is one of the most delicate and technical parts of the process. Grub must prepare in memory a series of data structures and parameters following the Linux kernel boot protocol, the so-called Linux boot protocol. It must specify where the kernel command line is located, where the init art is in memory, how much memory is available in the system, the physical memory map, the root device address, information about detected hardware, in UFI mode, Grub must also pass UFI tables, ACPI, SMBIOS, pointers to UFI runtime services, the UFI memory map. Finally, Grub is ready for the grand finale. It literally makes a jump to the memory address where the kernel's entry point is located. And remember, this is just an example for the x86 architecture. Grub actually has specific functions and handoff routines for more than 10 different architectures. Each platform, like ARM, PowerPC, Spark, RISC-V, and others, requires a unique approach for transferring control to the operating system. What we've seen here is the x86 case, but under the hood, Grub is much more versatile than most people imagine. But how does this actually happen in the code? This is where one of the most critical functions comes into play. Grub Relocator 32 Score Boot Real Mode. This function is responsible for making sure the CPU is in the right state, all parameters are in the correct place in memory, and then, without hesitation, making the final leap. Here's how this moment looks in the Grub source code, simplified. And if you look closely at the actual source code, you'll even find a comment left by the Grub developers right after this critical jump. This little line is a sort of wink from the developer. It means, we know you should never ever get here. If, for some strange reason, this return statement actually runs, Something has gone terribly wrong. It's common in low-level code, especially bootloaders and kernels, where certain jumps are so final that if you ever return, the whole logic of the program is broken. In practice, the actual work is handled by the Grub Relocator 32 boot real mode function. Its job is to carefully set the CPU in real mode, organize memory exactly as the kernel expects, and finally perform the jump using a low-level assembly instruction. Final jump. Goodbye Grub, hello Linux. From that exact moment, the bootloader disappears and the real Linux kernel starts. It's a leap with no return. If anything goes wrong here, the system won't boot. Once the kernel takes control, its own startup sequence begins. 1. Decompression. The kernel decompresses itself in memory 2. Hardware initialization. It detects and initializes all system hardware. Mount entity. 
it loads the initard into RAM and mounts it as a temporary root. 4. Driver loading. It loads essential drivers to access the disk where the real system lives. 5. Switch root. It switches from the temporary root to the real root. 6. Start in it. It finds and starts the first user space process, usually suspin in it or system D. From here, true Linux user space begins. System daemon start, network services spin up, the login manager and desktop environment launch. Everything we know as the operating system. Why all this is fascinating? When you truly understand the entire chain that runs from powering on your computer all the way to seeing a shell or your desktop, you can finally appreciate the incredible work behind tools like Grub. It's not just a little program, it's a micro universe that in just a few hundred kilobytes and with extremely limited resources builds the bridge between raw hardware and the power of a modern operating system like Linux. Grub must be compatible with hardware that's 20 plus years old as well as the latest tech. 100% reliable because if it breaks, your system won't boot. Fast so it doesn't slow down startup. Flexible to handle complex setups, RAID, LVM, encryption. Minimal to take up as little precious space as possible. And next time your PC boots up in just a few seconds, you'll know that behind the scenes, a little hero is hard at work. Grub, the grand unified bootloader that makes possible everything we take for granted every single day.